Hey podcast listeners, this is Robert Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. I recorded this episode with Christine Peterson at Effective Altruism Global in San Francisco last month. Christine has been working on risks from new technologies for decades. She starts by describing the young and idealistic social scene in Silicon Valley that she was a part of in the 80s, which in some ways resembles today's effective altruism community. We then talk about how the fundamental lack of security in our computer systems could end up posing a huge threat to civilization. We then talk about how you can plan out your life in order to accomplish more, including taking proper care of yourself, choosing a good life partner, and taking risks at the right times. As always, you can apply for coaching if you want to work on any of the problems discussed in this episode, and you can subscribe by searching for 80,000 Hours in your podcasting app. And now I bring you Christine Peterson. Today, I'm speaking with Christine Peterson. Christine is co-founder of the Foresight Institute, a non-profit focused on speeding up the benefits and reducing the risks from coming revolutionary technologies, especially nanotechnology, AI, and longevity advances. She's also credited with coining the term open source software. Christine also thinks the AA community should explore the high leverage opportunities available when working on problems at the earliest possible upstream stages, where measurement is most challenging. So we'll get to discussing that. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Christine. Oh, it's it's so fun to be here, Rob. We're going to spend a lot of time going through Christine's perspective on a bunch of different technologies and how they could affect the world and and make the future either uh, better or worse. But first, it looks like you've done a ton of stuff in the course of your life. Uh, Tell us a bit about how you ended up uh, where you are today. Wow. Um, When I was growing up, I wasn't, I can't say I was particularly altruistic. I wasn't raised to be especially altruistic. Uh, My parents didn't spend a huge amount of time doing charitable work. But when I went away to college, I met a new kind of folks, people who were focused on very ambitious goals. Uh, at that time, the primary focus among young people was environmental, uh, as, as it often is today as well. Uh, that was the overriding concern among young people at that point. And so we were all searching for answers. How can we solve the environmental problems facing the, the earth today? So how did you first get pulled into efforts to try to make a re- really big difference to the world? What, what were you doing uh, when you were in your 20s or 30s? The first altruistic effort that really got my attention was, oddly perhaps, space settlement. Now, the listeners may say, what? How is this, al- <laughs> number one, how is this altruistic? And number two, how does this fit in with this environmental concern? Uh, but at the time, um, back then, the uh, concern was running out of resources and overpopulation. Those were the two, the two main issues. We weren't really looking so much at climate change back then. So we were thinking about how, how can we support larger numbers of people? Uh, at that time, the population was growing. It wasn't slowing as it, as it seems to be now. Uh, and also, where can we find more resources? So we're looking for where can people live, where are their resources. The Earth is, by definition, limited. Uh, and at, remember, this was all, not that long after the big space program of the U.S., so we were all very aware. We'd grown up watching tremendous numbers of space launches and you know, men walking on the moon for the first time. It was very exciting. So we were very aware of space and space resources, and it was starting to be come known that the asteroids had tremendous amounts of resources. Uh, we were starting to learn uh, uh, what's out there and realized, wow, there actually are resources out there, especially immense amounts, obviously, of solar power, more than you could ever use, um, 24 hours a day up there, of course, uh, and continuous. So, um, so we thought, wow, there's energy, there's resources, you could actually live in space. And this at the time was a relatively new idea. Prior to that, only in science fiction was that explored. It wasn't taken seriously. Um, but increasingly this was seen as an actual option, and I think, I think it is a real option. It will happen someday. So we young idealistic people were saying, hey, let's, let's do space settlement as, as, as another way to deal with environmental issues. We didn't pretend it solved all the problems, but it would it would clearly help relieve the overpopulation burden. It would make a lot more resources available to the human species without having to continually take them out of the earth. Um, so the, the idea was that it would lift the burden of uh, human civilization off our fragile biosphere. And at the same time, as we all know, right now we have all our eggs in one basket here on Earth. There are existential risks 
that could occur that would actually wipe out all life on Earth. And so colonizing space is another way to deal with that. Um, it's, it's, so it, it has an existential risk benefit as well. So this is the uh, Elon Musk SpaceX strategy, trying trying to go to Mars. Uh. It is, although the um, this because it preceded Elon, we were looking more at initially the Moon, but also freestanding space settlements, perhaps at the L five point. Some of your um, older listeners may remember the L five Society, which was a very idealistic, very young organization dedicated to building space settlements freestanding. Um, where you create the gravity by rotating the settlement. So I don't know that much about the history of this movement. Uh, what, what, what became of it? Uh, the, I think the basic ideas are still there. Obviously, people like Elon Musk are carrying forward the, the concepts. Um, and I think freestanding space settlements will happen eventually when, when the economic time is right. I think we were too early. Uh, but I think the basic concepts we developed were right. I think they will happen eventually. The activists from that movement largely moved on to, um, to nanotechnology, which is what I did myself when, when we realized, wow, this is another way to, uh, to uh, address the huge environmental challenges that we want to take on. Is that because they thought it was a more promising technology? They, they could see more of a path towards nanotechnology? I would say it was, we all understood that the space settlement vision, although technically feasible, is extremely expensive to start. Once you get it going, yes, then you can mine the asteroids and there's tremendous value there. So, uh, but the upfront costs are immense. So, uh, in the U.S. at this point, um, the space program was kind of faltering and we could see, wow, this is not taking off as we had hoped as fast as we wished. Um, but nanotechnology is based on the science of chemistry, and that's, some, that's a small science. So the investments compared to space are more manageable. Mm. So we became a little more practical, which is kind of typical <laughs> of, you know, you get your People super... As they get older. Well, it's and, true. You say, all right, let's, now we really want to get something done uh, that is actually going to work. So uh, I, I think um, Foresight attracted a lot of these former super idealistic young people who were starting to, instead of being in their 20s, now they're... They're in their late 20s, they're in their early 30s, and, and they're, they're looking for, all right, how can we get more leverage uh, to help our environmental problems? Hmm. So in the last few years, you've encountered the effective altruism movement. Uh, what, what, what do you make of it? Is, it? is it similar to the groups you were involved with uh, when you were uh, in your 20s? Oh, absolutely. And it's the same kind of folks, extremely intelligent people, uh, quite idealistic, quite ambitious, uh, which I think is appropriate. I think every, every, you know, when you have a new generation of extremely intelligent, very idealistic people, you want them to be ambitious. You want them to take on the hardest problems in the world. And that's what effective altruism is doing. Yeah. Do you have any uh, advice for us? Uh, do, do we need to maybe get, get more practical and focus on things that are, that are easier to do, like, like the, um, the, the space people did in the 80s and 70s? Well, my initial exposure to effective altruism was, was um, to some of the earliest documents and the earliest visions. And there was, uh, in some of those, there was a very high emphasis on measurement. Uh, there was a high emphasis on, um, on things. Uh, there was a lot of discussion of bed nets. Now, I have not, we all like bed, they're a good thing, right? We like bed nets. However, somehow I got the impression that it was overemphasized and that, uh, and that effective altruists were perhaps overly focused on measurement, overly focused on near-term goals. And I, my gut reaction was, no, no, you guys are the most intelligent, most ambitious, most energetic. You're at a time of your life where you don't have a lot of burdens on you. You don't, you're not raising kids yet. Now is not the time to focus on near-term, easy-to-measure goals. Now is the time to take on the biggest, hardest, most revolutionary things you possibly can and throw yourselves at them because some of you will succeed. Not most of you, but some of you will succeed, and that's super important. So, you know, we don't, what we do not want to do is all go work on Wall Street to make money for bed nets. It would help with the bed net issue, but there are there are bigger we can get much more leverage by taking on harder problems uh, and that's why i'm kind of advocating people look at problems that are challenges that are longer term more abstract 
Uh, you don't get the warm fuzzies that you get from things like bed nets. I mean, if you, if you work on something that's quantifiable and that saves lives, you get, you know, you, you get major warm fuzzies from that. The idea that, you know, I personally saved a hundred lives. I mean, that's huge, right? However, only, uh, my advocacy would be that only people who need warm fuzzies should do things that produce warm fuzzies. Because if there's, I know there's some fraction of effective altruists who don't need that. They are very abstract thinkers. They're very long term. They generate their own, uh, their own excitement about what they're doing. And they have their, a small group of friends who also feel that way. And they can get all the social support they need from that. They don't need external, uh, validation. They don't need it. No. And they don't need, they don't need very short term rewards. They have very long time horizons. And then those of you who are listening who have long time horizons, hopefully are resonating with this and saying, yes, I don't need these short term rewards. I am willing to work on a project for 20, 30, 40 years. I'm even willing to work on projects that extend beyond my own lifespan. I will do that. You know, human poverty, we are not going to fix that soon. You know, that's a really hard problem. Um, the, the, uh, environmental issues are a hard problem. So, if you if you want to work on those, you have to be willing to really postpone gratification. But if you're good at that, and I know some of you are very good at that, I would urge you to do it. Take on something super hard. Because the number of people on the planet who will do that is tiny. So we need all of you who can do it to do it. I think that's a... Uh uh, a fair, fair criticism, perhaps. It, even in the early days of effective altruism, uh, when I was involved, I think uh, we were talking in some places about these like really big technological challenges and how you could get, you know, have very high risk, high return projects. But most people, if you only read, a, if you only read about it for fifteen minutes or an hour, then you would mostly encounter the, the ideas that were easiest to explain that you would put first, which is uh, yeah, bed nets and quantification and all of that. But I, I think fortunately, the, the focus is, is getting broader uh, as, as as we mature. Have you found effective altruism, uh, like changing the culture in, in the groups that, that you're involved with? Uh, we're, we're, we're relatively new, but uh, are, we, are we having any impact as far as you can see? Yes, I think so. Um, I think um, because it's a broad movement, uh, I think it's attracting, it's attracting more young people to come together in one movement. Before, I think we probably had perhaps... Um, we had a lot of a lot of young people involved in many different causes, but they weren't coordinating. They weren't coming together at the kind of meeting we're at today, Effective Altruism Global, where you have people from throughout the movement uh, coming together at least once a year to compare notes, to give our give each other. You know, I said that you don't get warm fuzzies in some of our work. The way we get our, we need, human beings do need some positive feedback, and the way we do it is at these kinds of events. We see our friends, maybe someone we only see once a year, but these are people we feel very close to. And when they say, you know, I really admire what you're doing, that can last you a whole year. Yeah, I agree. You're a co-founder at the, the Foresight Institute, uh, which has been around for a couple of decades, and, and you're still involved with it. Uh, what is it. What does the Foresight Institute do? Our goal is to maximize the benefits and minimize the downsides of coming advanced technologies. Uh, our primary focus has been on nanotechnology. Uh, we have... Uh, we are permitted by our, docu our originating documents to take on any technology. Our, uh, we are ramping up now work on artificial intelligence. Just this Thursday, we were taking advantage of the fact that so many effective altruists were coming into town here for this event that we said, wow, let's get them in one day early and do a satellite event mm -hmm. on artificial general intelligence. So because so many great people were coming into town, plus the fact that we have a lot of good folks here in the Bay Area as well, we got together a, an excellent group of folks to brainstorm about the future of artificial intelligence and how to, again, maximize the benefits, but more important in terms of AI is minimize the downsides. Um, you know, the for-profit sector focuses on delivering benefits. The nonprofit sector, at least at, for foresight, we focus on minimizing downsides because for-profit companies don't do that, and the government is very slow. 
um, the government hasn't even figured out about AI at all yet, and they're not going to notice it until it's way too late. So uh, as you know, as your listeners probably know, there are a number of groups out there now, some of them pretty well funded, looking at the future of AI, but it turns out they don't talk to each other enough, and that was something we had kind of noticed, and we said, well, we can work, we can fix that, because they're coming here, let's get them, let's pull them in a day early and do a heavy duty, serious workshop and make them really work together. And so we did that, it worked really well, I'm, I'm thrilled about it. What kind of specific things did you talk about? Uh, the initial workshop goal was to take note of the fact that time frames for AGI have shortened. Um, people have been kind of noticing that, uh, either one by one or in small groups. You mean people are expecting uh, artificial general intelligence to be invented sooner? That's right. Yeah. Well, what, uh, what kind of time, times are we talking about? <laughs> Well, let's see. So you always get a range. Yeah. No matter any, whatever group, even if you ask one person, you never get a single number, and that's correct. We, we, we can't predict the future. However, if you picture a kind of a bell curve and say, you know, where, where, where is the, uh, where do we start seeing significant percentages of chances? Um, we're starting to hear some numbers under 10 years which is kind of surprising. It's a, a bit certainly, alarming. It is a little alarming, yes. Now, that doesn't mean that those, those are not the fifth, that's not the, the peak of the bell curve. The peak of the bell curve is still out there farther. But it's, but people are realizing, gee, you know, it's, it's, there is some, there is some chance, some non-trivial chance that it could be under 10 years. And that means we have basically no time. So that changes strategies. If that's true, then all of the AI organizations, um, although their primary focus may stay with the longer time frames, because statistically that's still uh, perhaps likely, but we need to have strategies that are robust across a variety of time frames, including relatively near-term ones. And perhaps a, a different people adopting different strategies. So some people are focusing on what what do we do if a, a you know artificial intelligence is invented in eight years, and what do we do if it comes in twenty five years? And other people thinking, what if it takes sixty years? Uh, you know, we will need to interview those individual groups. I think each one is re they're still all realizing. Of course, obviously, it's still a bell curve that hasn't changed. It's just that that the um, that has it has shifted a little bit to the left in terms of sh slightly shorter time frames, and um, I think everyone is realizing no, we really need to go to these robust strategies mm -hmm. where whatever we're working on is useful across different time frames. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it was good to get all the groups together. We got almost all of them in one room and say, all right, let's all acknowledge this. Um, and uh, we also wanted to talk a little bit about compare different countries, com uh, start to speculate about what uh, what societal reactions might be. Um, and the main the main goal was to get the groups talking. And and we also designed a series of future workshops. So those will happen if funding is is if funding can be found for them. Do you know if uh, the timelines for AGI development are shortening because it's turned out to be an easier problem than we thought, or is it because you know the for-profit sector is just shoveling as much money as they can at this problem? I think uh, the feeling was more in the latter, which okay. is yeah. um, people are seeing uh, that this is very powerful technology, even in the early stages, even way before you get to AGI. Just what we have now is extremely profitable technology. Uh, obviously, it has applications in terms of military use. So, uh, yeah, lots and lots of, of investment in terms of money and also some of the brightest minds, right? It, this is attracting some of the brightest people in the world, around the world. Yeah. How did Foresight Institute get off the ground? What happened was um, I was at MIT as an undergrad, and one of my friends who uh, actually is also, uh, I don't know, directly or indirectly in the effective altruist movement because he works at Future of Humanity Institute, which is one of the EA groups, uh, Eric Drexler was also an undergrad at that time. Mm -hmm. And we were both interested in space, and then he was the one who had the insights, the original insights, that, wow, um, 
atomically precise manufacturing, what we called nanotechnology back then, is technically possible. Do you want to explain what atomically precise manufacturing is? Because I think sure. a lot of people have misconceptions about what, what nanotechnology refers to. Well, the term is used in a lot of different ways. The particular type of nanotechnology that excited us as undergrads at MIT at the time was saying, uh, if you look at uh, biological systems, and at that time, some of the early work was being done seeing how biological systems build things with DNA and RNA and proteins, all that. We were realizing, wow, this is not unique to life. Uh, you could build artificial systems that could do something very like this, uh, but even better. Um, you could build, uh, build products, uh, both small products and eventually large product products with, uh, with every atom in a designed location. Obviously, you have to follow the rules of chemistry. There's no way around that. Uh, but as long as you stay within them, then you could construct pretty much whatever you wanted uh, with atomic precision, being inspired by what we see, that's uh, how it's done in nature. So that was the fundamental insight that he had. And we were both very young at the time, and... When you hear revolutionary things as a very young person, you're not that surprised because you don't have a baseline to compare it with. So when I heard these insights from him, I thought, okay, sure, why not? You know, I knew enough chemistry at that stage to say, well, this doesn't seem to violate the laws of chemistry, uh, that, which is critical. That's the first thing you check. Uh, does, is this physically possible? And if it is physically possible, then you have to say, all right, how would we get there? How long is this going to take? And how expensive is it going to be? Hmm. But you, you, you could have gone into a lab in academia and, or industry and tried to develop atomically precise manufacturing, but instead you uh, made a nonprofit that's focused on the risks and rewards and, and so on. What, why, why do that? We could see that this technology, when it reached its full extent, would have tremendously revolutionary consequences for society. Some of them would be, many of them would be positive. There's the huge environmental benefits, huge medical benefits. Uh, and then, of course, there's always the problem of, of military use, uh, military offensive use. So we felt, gee, you know, rather than go into the lab and, and do this ourselves, prior to that, we really should try to get the word out about both the positive and the negative results of this world that's coming. And that was the decision to, that we made that, all right, we will, we will open up, open up this information to the world so that we aren't alone in this. Quite a lot of people are skeptical that you can do a lot of pre preparatory work uh, to, to make sure that um, new technologies are, are used well and, and, and don't cause harms. And I guess to, to some extent, it's, it's been a little while now and atomically precise manufacturing isn't here and it doesn't seem like it's exactly around the corner. So one, one could say that some of the early work there might have been wasted or perhaps it was, was premature. Uh, what, what do you think of those criticisms? That's re that's a, it's a great debate to have. I wish I knew the answer. And to go back to something we talked about before, this is one of those cases where uh, you're doing a one-off, unique activity, and because there is no way to run any kind of a control, we will never be sure. We'll never know. Uh, we can guess. We can speculate whether it was a good thing or not to do that. Um, but it's it's literally impossible to know. It's all it's just speculation. Um, all we can have is kind of a gut feel and say, well, I think it was better that we did this that we're, that we didn't, or we can say, well, I wish we had just gone in the lab and done it. So, um, it's I don't know how to make that evaluation. Yeah, who funds a startup nonprofit focused on making a technology that doesn't exist yet safe? We realized that they were powerful ideas and that if, for example, a book could be written that conveyed them in a persuasive way, we felt that it would start a movement. And that was true. Uh, the book was written. 
um, I, I, my, I didn't write the book. I, I helped comment on it, but my role was more on an, uh, of an earn to give situation. Um, I spent about five years in the only job I've ever had that wasn't altruistic, uh, and just to make some money. I did my, uh, my activism in, uh, in my spare time. And the money that I was making went into making sure this book happened. So that was my earn to give phase. And what's the book, sorry? The name of the book is Engines of Creation. It is still in print. It is still inspirational. I try to read it every now and then because it is, it is still a super inspirational book. Mm, that's, that's about, by Drexler, right? That's right. Mm. Let's dive uh, deeper into the nanotechnology question. So in effective altruism, there's a, l- a lot of interest in this issue of revolutionary technologies and, and how they could transform society. But nanotechnology hasn't gotten gotten so much attention, perhaps because people just don't think that it's it's going to like they think that AI is going to come sooner, or that perhaps uh, biotechnologies are going are going to come sooner. Uh, should we be be more focused on it? Um, I think uh, people who think that AI is going to come sooner and biotech is going to come sooner. I would agree with that. I think that is probably true. Now, uh, we were having debates 20 or 30 years ago, which would come first, nanotech or AI? Back then, it really wasn't clear. Uh, and, and, of course, today it's not 100% clear. But I think most people at this point are betting AI will be first. So that's part of the reason why uh, Foresight is starting to ramp up our AI work. We're, we are... Uh, making the same observation that everyone else is saying, wow, this is moving fast, so much money is piling in, it's a worldwide effort, um, and it looks like, I, this means that nanotechnology will still come, but it will probably arrive in a world with, 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 uh, with AI, and that's a different looking space. Mm-hmm. What kinds of scenarios uh, would we be worried about if, 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 if uh, atomically precise manufacturing turned out to be a lot easier to create and perhaps uh, we could actually develop it in 10 or 15 years? What, what, what are the risks? Well, the primary downside would be deliberate abuse. Uh, in the early days, we were looking at accident scenarios, and, I, and those are con- still conceivable. But I think in terms of likelihood of problems, uh, most people would say, no, the real issue is deliberate abuse for, ha- uh, for example, smart weapons, very smart, very targeted weapons. Um, How would you target atomically precise manufacturing machines? W- wouldn't they just tend to spread out of control and uh, you know, blow back on whoever tried to use them? I would say that to some extent this is a software issue. Uh, these devices would need to be controlled with software, and as we all know, uh, you know, if you look at hardware systems and software systems, the software ones are much harder to understand. They're hard to, con- they're, they're hard to, it's hard to get software to do what you really want. So to the extent that um, any type of machine goes haywire and comes back and, and bites its originators, uh, if software is involved, often software is the issue. And in fact, software security, computer security, is a huge, huge issue. Foresight is taking, uh, as far as I can tell, I haven't, I haven't heard of another organization um, that is taking it as seriously as we are. And that is in part because, uh, first of all, it's an immediate problem. It's happening right now. Uh, the risks are very high. The vulnerability is high. And it does affect um, how AGI will play out in the future. Hmm. All right, we'll, we'll come back to, to that one. It, nanotechnology might be a lower probability risk, but it's also more neglected. How many people in the world do you think are working on risks from, from nanotechnology? Oh, very few at this point. Um, there are very few, actually, there are very few people working on uh, biological and chemical risks compared to the magnitude of those problems also. There just aren't that many people working on risk of that, of that risks of those types. Yeah. So it still could be useful potentially, uh, even even if we think it's quite unlikely that nanotechnology is coming soon or, or is coming before other breakthrough technologies. If we feel that our AGI is coming before molecular nanotechnology, then 
it's still worth thinking about scenarios involving it, but you have to do it in a totally different way because basically you have to solve the AGI problem first. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge, it's a huge, it makes it very hard to even start to think about molecular Mm -hmm. nanotechnology because first you have to fix the AGI problem, and we're nowhere near that. I guess I'm thinking it now looks maybe 90% likely that we'll get artificial general intelligence before nanotechnology, but that could turn out to be wrong. Maybe uh, nanotechnology will turn out to be a lot easier to develop, and AI will will turn out that this machine learning isn't actually the paradigm that that we need to to develop AI. So maybe you want to have a few people in the back pocket, uh, you know, working on what what would we do if uh, atomically precise manufacturing came first? Yes, I think that's true. I think it would be wise for society as a whole to recognize that that possibility. Um, we're Society as a whole right now is not very good at allocating yeah. people to low probability risks. And yeah. so, uh, frankly, we, need, we don't have enough people working even on the major risks yeah. right now. So... Uh, once we get that under control, then we can start to say, "All right, let's Think let's allocate seconds, some yeah. folks to the to the less likely things." Yeah. How can you tell if uh, the Foresight Institute is making a difference? What kind of metrics do you focus on? Well, that that comes back again to this challenge of um, measurability. I I realized pretty early on. I think we all did that foresight because it takes fairly complex positions on things. We're not 100% pro-technology and we're not 100% anti-technology. We take a balanced approach. Um, only a small segment of people have the time horizon and the balanced and, and, and can get passionate about balance, right? That's an unusual thing to get passionate about. Um, so I knew we were going to always be a small organization, but what that does is it gives us the freedom to work on precisely what we think is the most important thing. So you, what you have to do when you think about this is look back at the things that we've taken on over time and say, all right, um, you know, how, how did that go? For example, in the early days of foresight, even scientists, even, um, even the best scientists were still taking the position that atomic precision was not possible. Um, even a Nobel Prize physicist was arguing, no, we will never control uh, with atom, atom by atom. So the education effort has been tremendous. Uh, and I think that one, um, we were making good progress, uh, and then finally there was an experiment that showed that you actually can place atoms with precision. And then the debate was over. Uh-huh. Thank yeah. goodness. Tell us a bit about that, about that controversy. Well, it's funny because Richard Feynman, who many of you uh, know, is is uh, was a, a wonderful, brilliant physicist, um, gave a talk actually in 1959 where he he said that this was going to be possible. So it it's not as though nobody knew. Uh, it was it was clear if you were a brilliant physicist, you could see as early as 59 that this was going to happen. Uh, but but that knowledge seemed to have not been not been taken up by the scientific community. Uh, so we had a, a wide variety of people in science who, if you look at their credentials, you'd say, wow, I can believe this person on this issue who were completely confused and just they were not, they didn't have the level of understanding of science that Feynman had. So um, so we, we, we did what we tend to do at Foresight. We, what we do is we bring, bring the right people together. That's our goal. Uh, first figure out who are the right people, then bring them together. And so we had a series of meetings where we would bring in the very best people we could, uh, some of whom understood the point and, so, and many of whom who did not, and just make sure that when they left, everybody got it. Uh, and, and basically you seed the community. So in the in the eighties, uh, I, I only vaguely know this story, but but Drexler was saying that atomically precise manufacturing was going to be possible, and there were some pretty pretty prominent naysayers, right, who were writing articles saying effectively that that he he was a crank, admittedly a very well credentialed crank, but that he was just totally wrong about this. Uh, you, has the debate been been settled? Do you think? And, and, and what was what really was was the disagreement? I mean, you would think that the, the laws of physics or chemistry that we would have understood them well enough that that it wouldn't be possible to have a disagreement about something as specific as this. You you would think. I agree. Um, here's what happened. Um, 
There was a particular scientist who unfortunately now is deceased by the name of Richard Smalley, and he was at Rice University. He read Engines of Creation, got very excited, persu- uh, gave copies of the, my understanding is he gave copies of the book to the Board of Trustees at Rice and said, we, we want to be a leader in this at Rice, and got a bunch of money put aside for that and started doing it, and Rice today is, in fact, doing a lot in this space. But then... Um, the topic, uh, the topic of the risks of, of molecular nanotechnology was getting a lot of press coverage. This is the, the, the gray goo idea. Uh, yes, gray, took off. gray goo or military use or whatever, right? Downsides, general downsides. It was getting too much, too much attention in the press. And it's upset Professor Smalley. And so he decided, all right, this was a mistake to talk about. Um, I don't think he was arguing that molecular nanotechnology was not possible. I think he was more arguing we need uh, we need to stop talking about these potential downsides in public. Um, I think that was really what bothered him, and understandably so. So uh, that's really what the debate was about. And um, then when the press coverage died down, the whole issue kind of went away because it was not not a problem. So the problem that was causing those debates went away, and then unfortunately, uh, Dr. Smalley passed away. So he we can't he's not around to ask were you ever persuaded. Um, But I think um, I don't think that the idea of artificial molecular machines is controversial today, really. Okay. Well, let's let's push on. Uh, You and a colleague are doing a a one-hour workshop tomorrow uh, here at EA Global. Uh, What's what's the goal of the workshop? What are you talking about? Well, as a theme that's come up uh, as we've been talking more than once is this challenge of uh, deciding how, what challenges to take on when measurement is difficult. And that's the topic we're going to take on, which is uh, shall we do things where measurement is is not just difficult but perhaps impossible? I mean, in fact, if you look at the things I've done, I would say measurement is almost impossible on all of them. I can I can retroactively come up with a measurement scenario for the coining of the term open source software. I can come up with one. Uh, but in fact, the amount of time it would have taken to implement that scenario was more than the time it took me to do the work. So there'd be no point in doing it. Just do the work. And I did it. It was faster to do the work than it would have been to figure out whether to do the work. So I just did the work. Um, the Foresight Institute uh, was kind of at the, at the bleeding edge of this nanotechnology issue and, and this question of uh, revolutionary technologies. Uh, and I guess effective altruism is now similarly kind of a, a young movement with a, with a bunch of new ideas. I'm curious to know what, what kind of challenges did you, did you have early on and, and might they be similar to kind of some of the challenges that, that we might face in the future? Yes, uh, I think I think there are some similarities. I would say that any any early movement is going to attract a wide variety of folks, many of whom are extremely competent and have great social skills, some of whom are technically competent, maybe not such great social skills. And then on the fringe, you'll sometimes get some folks who are enthusiastic, but Ha, but it's very hard to figure out how they can contribute in any way. So the challenge for a young movement, and, and in the early days of a movement, you want to welcome everyone. We're all very enthusiastic. We're excited. We, we're we small. We want everyone to come in. We want everyone to participate. But then you realize, gosh, you know, while the vast majority of folks who are coming in are useful and helpful people, some of them, although they want to help, either... There are some, there's some issue. Either, either they don't, they don't, they don't know what they don't know. For example, they, they think their technical skills are better than they actually are, or they have per, some, um, serious social skill issues or even personality disorders. You just get everyone. It's like a, a cross section of the whole population. So the challenge for a new movement is to reconcile the goal of getting everyone involved and making everyone feel welcome which we would love to be able to do with the fact that not everyone has the same skill set. Some folks are are even challenging to work with at all. 
uh, how can we still allow them to contribute and to feel part of the group without slowing everybody else down? Hmm. How did you work around that that problem? Did, did you manage to, to do a good job of it? I think we did. Um, I think first first you have to admit admit this, uh, which is a stage in a in a young movement when you go from saying everybody is equally welcome and can can perform equally well in any task and realizing okay that's just not right. Let's start to figure out as people come to us, figure out all right what are their real skills. Um, and sometimes the person himself or herself knows that, and sometimes they don't. And then how can we direct them into a role in the organization that is, is the, the highest use of their time? Sometimes there are folks where really the best use of their time for the movement is in an earning to give role, and they can be made welcome at open events, uh, where, where their, their contributions are appreciated and they are giving, they're given those warm fuzzies we all need, but we don't necessarily put them in a, in a full-time role at the organization. Let's talk a bit more about uh, space settlement. Do, do you still think that that's uh, an interesting priority? What, what, what do you think of, of Elon Musk's strategy with, with SpaceX? Well, I think it will happen eventually, and I think it's something that should happen for existential risk reasons. I think it's also something that should happen for environmental reasons. So, so I think I think it will happen. I'm still in favor of it. Um, when you consider Elon's goal for Mars, other folks are more interested in the moon, uh, and then there's the L5 crowd that still advocate for freestanding space settlements. All those are three options that those are basically technical and economic choices. Uh, it's not something, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be, the decision shouldn't be made um, based on emotion or what's the sexiest goal. It should be based on what is economically and technically the most feasible. So Elon thinks Mars is, is it. I, there are other people who feel it's the other way, but one thing about Elon is, you know, he does get some stuff done, so <laughs> you have to give him credit for that. So, uh, you know, he may he may succeed at his goal just because he's pushing so hard and uh, he has some money to throw at it. I feel like Elon gets more done in a month than I might might hope to accomplish in a lifetime. That said, I've I've been something of a a, a critic of this idea of space colon, space colonization as a way of dealing with with existential risk. Um, the, the idea is to kind of back up humanity on Mars. So if there's ever a disaster on Earth, or at least this is one reason that you might do it, uh, go to Mars so that um, you have a second copy and potentially they can come back and recolonize Earth if humanity is in deep trouble or, or even extinct here. I think if, if that was your goal, wouldn't it be a lot cheaper just to stick people under a mountain in a mine shaft or, or, or dig, you know, dig very deep and create a very... Uh, you know, um, uh, a bunker that's that's extremely well stocked and people could live for a long time or put people under the sea or, or, or on Antarctica. Those places are all very difficult to have freestanding independent colonies, but they're still a lot easier than, than Mars, I would think. I think you make a good point. Um, and I think for, for some existential risk scenarios, that would be the way to go. Um, I think longer term, you know, we don't really know when a very, very large rock is going to hit the Earth and really mess it up completely. So you can admit there are existential risk scenarios where nah, you really and and then you can you can say go beyond that and say well there are some existential risk scenarios where even being on Mars isn't good enough. Yeah. So in the in the in the very long term, you want to keep going. You want to just get out of the solar system entirely, mm -hmm. but that is, again, a very long-term goal. So, mm -hmm. yes, I would agree with you that um, those, other, those other scenarios you describe are ways to address some, some existential risk scenarios. But I should also mention that if there's anyone who thinks that colonizing Mars is a way to deal with the AI existential risk to humanity, I would say I don't see that as an answer. I don't think if there were a Mars colony and there were a problem with AI on the Earth, I don't think Mars would be independent of that. Yeah. My impression is uh, Elon now, now agrees with that. That's good, because I a lot of folks had thought he was seeing it the other way, so it's good to hear that that has been clarified. You had some involvement in the free software movement when it, when it was developing, right? Uh, what, what, what did you contribute there? What happened was Foresight was developing some free software that enabled um, annotations to be made on web pages. That was being that was written by Ka Ping Yi, who is a very active altruist 
in the developing world now. Uh, so uh, we had decided this would be free software. So we were in in communication with a lot of folks in that movement, including the ones that uh, who were about to release the Netscape code, which was the first major company to release code as free software. And our group, and, and I felt most passionately that the term free software was holding back the movement. And there's a very simple reason, which is when new people were introduced to the term free software, they all thought it meant free as in price. Every single time, that's what they thought. And you'd have to go into a long explanation saying, no, that's not what we mean. We really mean this other thing, even though it really is free. Yes, it's free, but that's not what we mean. And people would just, they'd glaze over. Um, and Richard Stallman would say, well, we mean free as in freedom, not free as in beer. And now you're in a discussion of alcoholic <laughs> beverage prices, which is not the goal. It's fairly poor branding, I guess. It was awful. And, and much as we all love Richard, it was a, it was a real problem. So we all kind of felt the term was wrong, and we'd talk about it and kind of try to brainstorm new terms, and we just weren't really coming up with anything. Then I had on my own, probably in the shower, you know how it is when you have ideas in the shower, uh, probably in the shower I thought, well, you know, how about just open source? That's clear, pretty clear. It's, anyway, it's, it's not great, but it's better than free software. So I, I asked a few people, and most of them said, yeah, that's okay. One guy said, who's in, who was in PR, he said, no, he said the word open's overused. But he was overruled by the fact that other people liked it. And, but, but uh, now the challenge was introducing it. How do you change the name of a movement? Like, what if somebody decided that effective altruism was a bad name, but and they had a better name? How would they introduce it? I mean, you have an active movement. You can't just rename it. Yeah. It's not easy to do. You have to have the movement agree with you. So, and I was not a coder. To to have prestige in the free software community, you write free software. And if you can't write co software at all, you have no prestige at all. You have no standing. So, uh, so How did what happened? Well, what happened was I was helping out uh, Eric Raymond. He was visiting in the Bay Area. He had prestige in the community. So we had a, a, a meeting. It wasn't about the name at all. We we weren't discussing that. Um, but one of the other people in the room knew about knew about this proposed new name of, that I was hoping to introduce. But I could see, you know, give, given my lack of prestige in this group, I, there was, I had no standing to even bring up the issue. I think people probably thought that I was either Eric Raymond's chauffeur or possibly his girlfriend, <laughs> which I was not. I was married at the time. So, uh, so we were talking away on other issues, and uh, me, me actually being silent, when this other fellow who knew the name, he just used it. He didn't propose it. He just used it as the term. And I thought, whoa, okay, let's see what happens now. And they talked away for a while, and then somebody else just used it. It's like, whoa, the meme has jumped. The virus has spread to a new, new mind automatically. We didn't even have to suggest it. It just jumped. Uh, and that's when I thought, okay, this is going to work. Um, and it was not until quite a bit later that the community actually held a vote of the leadership. And I was not there, which is appropriate, as I was not a leader in that community. So the leaders of the community made an active a decision to rename it. Um, they voted between the term sourceware, which was also a good term, and open source. And I guess open source got more votes. We had a slightly similar experience on a much smaller scale uh, at 80,000 hours in the, in the very early days. Uh, some, some people might remember that owning to give used to be called uh, professional philanthropy uh, for about a year, but we found that uh, that was quite a confusing term to a lot of people because they were imagining Bill Gates and, and Zuckerberg. Uh, it, it had uh, more of an emphasis on being richer as a philanthropist and, and, and giving, giving the money away rather than uh, going out and trying to make the money. So we uh, basically decided in one day, we're going to call this earning to give now. Uh, we sent an, an email to the, to the uh, professional philanthropy uh, Google group uh, Google, uh, at, the, at the time, and then we just started calling it that, and basically the switch was overnight. It was, it was very easy, but the, the group was a lot smaller then. I think trying to rename it today or trying to rename effective altruism would be a real uphill battle. Well, fortunately, both earning to give and effective altruism are pretty darn good terms, I think. 
We talked about computer security uh, briefly earlier. Is that something that we should be recommending that more people go in and, and specialize in and but become real experts who can contribute and, and make computers safer? I would say yes. I mean, if you look at the future, the future is run by computers. Nothing will be not computerized, right? But we're already largely there. And the problem is these computers are comp- are almost in every case, are insecure. Um, it's not going to be very long before auto- automated software, and I'm not referring to AGI here. I'm referring to AI of AI, the AI of today, maybe AI of today plus two, three years, um, is going to be automatically able to probe for flaws in security in the software. And what that means is they are going to take they they have they're going to have the capability to take them all down. And our civilization now is dependent on these machines. Um, we will not get food. We, we will not get water. We will not get electricity if they get if they are taken down. So uh, the scenarios are pretty serious in terms of. I wouldn't say that it's not an existential risk for humanity, but it is a huge catastrophic risk. What what can we do? Is is it actually possible to make computers secure, or is this just uh, do they have to be air gapped or something really extreme to to make sure that people can't break into them? Well, fortunately, they don't have to be air gapped because that would basically mean we can't have networking, and and networking is absolutely necessary. So no, there are. T- it turns out there are two uh, trusted code bases that we can build on. You can't. It is possible to build secure software. Um, there is, for example, coming from one side in terms of a trusted operating system, we have the SEL4 system, which has been actively uh, validated as secure, so we can build on that. Also, um, the blockchain has proven so far to be pretty darn reliable. And if you think about it, the Bitcoin code is is code that has like a $40 billion bug bounty on it at this point, and that has not been taken down. So that's pretty impressive. So yes... Software, secure software is possible. It just needs to be in a very hostile environment. It needs to be attacked continually to be proven to be soft, to be proven to be secure. And, but that can be done. Uh, is it, is software only proven secure when people try to crack it for a long time and, and they can't succeed? Or is there some way of, you know, mathematically proving that a piece of software just, just cannot, even in principle, be broken? My impression is yes, that both ways work. Um, I think here's how I think about it as a non-programmer. If for a small enough piece of code, you can sometimes do the mathematical proof. For something really big, uh, you may it, perhaps you can't do it that way. Then what you have to do is just do these continual attacks, mm-hmm. and and uh, that would perhaps give you the the level of uh, comfort that you need. Presumably, if you had these AI algorithms that were extremely good at probing software for weaknesses, then you could also use that to test your own software. Absolutely. Uh, but I guess you just need to make sure that the people developing the software are, are on the frontier of that technology, so they're not they're not outfoxed. Absolutely, you need to have a really good red team um, attacking. And um, fortunately, the U.S. has an excellent red team. It's called the National Security Agency. They do this all the time, and they're very good at it. So if we could get they, them... They don't always share their findings, though, do they? No, they do not. And that is something that we can work with them on and say, okay, uh, there's been a proposal by... Um, uh, I. I won't say who proposed this because I'm not sure I'm allowed to say who it was, but maybe he'll step forward. Uh, that what we do is say, all right, um, the entire treasure trove of vulnerabilities that the NSA is holding will be released in 10 years. You have a 10-year deadline. You have to get off all these insecure uh, software systems and start over and build secure software. So everyone has to quit Windows? What is that? Yep. Really? And Apple and the whole deal. Yeah, they're but, but insecure. Won't they, they just patch them? You can't. They're in, they're fundamentally insecure. But but it, they released that treasure trove of all of the vulnerabilities, uh, and then Microsoft and Apple just you know they have a very busy month or something fixing them up, and then then isn't it good? Um, I don't think that will work because I think you you really have to change paradigms. This patching business, I mean. There, if you ha- it's like a pail with innumerable holes in it. You patch them, and then it rusts through in another area. They're just fundamentally not secure systems. Yeah. W- would these secure systems uh, be user-friendly? Is, uh, is there a reason that they're not used now? There is a reason why they're not used now. It takes a little more work to work with them. You have Basically, you have to think about security the whole time you're building. 
uh, rather than try to rather than first design the system and then try to add a security layer on top, that doesn't work. So you have to. So it, it take, it's a new way of thinking. Yeah, it basically it's a new paradigm and it's a new it's a new set of operating systems. So yeah, people resist it for obvious reasons, and there's no reason to make the change until the computing environment gets hostile enough that you are forced to do it. But I think now those of us who look forward, like effective altruists tend to do, and say we can see this coming. We know this is coming. There's no doubt about it. We have a certain amount of time to get ready. How about if we try to get ready? And now, many people will not get ready, but um, but we can try to do what we can to secure, for example, the electricity supply would be nice. Most important thing. For example, yeah. yeah. Well, this, this is a pretty new topic for me, so I'll try to find some links that we can put up uh, in, the, in, in the notes on the, on the show, and uh, I'll be interested to, to learn more about that. If uh, someone listening wants to go into computer security, do you, I know this isn't your area, but do you have any advice for what, what maybe they should study or where they should where they should get jobs to to uh, build up their skills? For sure, um, in the in the show notes here, we'll link to a paper uh, with the uh, that was the technical the most technical co author is Mark Miller, uh, who is affiliated with Foresight and also has a day job at Google uh, on computer security. So. In, that, in the show notes is a, a paper where we address um, AGI risk and cyber risk, and that gives references to, to most of the things we've been talking about, the SEL4 work, and that will lead you into Mark's publication lists, uh, and he's published a great deal about this. Okay, let's talk about the uh, last category of technology uh, that uh, you have a, have a big interest in. Um, you've done some work to try to prevent aging and increase humans uh, healthy lifespan what do you uh, why do you see this as such an important area to work in I, th- I think there's two ways to come at it one is if you just look at the number of human life years lost to aging um, it is it far outweighs any other disease that that we're tackling as an EA group. So if 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 human health and and disease is your concern, I think aging aging wins in terms of just the number of of human life years lost total. It's by far or like orders of magnitude. So so there's that argument. Um, and then from a very personal perspective, you know, most of our listeners perhaps are young EAs, but they, imagine yourself uh, as an older person. You've built up these decades of experience doing effective altruism, and now it's going to be, it's going to disappear. Now, you can try to pass that on to young people, and, and older people do try to do that, but there's a lot of losses there. So in terms of the, the basically the intellectual capital of the EA movement itself, um, aging is going to is going to decimate it. It's going to be awful. Yeah, I think this this would be one of the the biggest economic effects of uh, reducing aging. Uh, at the moment, people tend to study for between you know the first eighteen years of their life, maybe thirty years if they're going through and finishing a PhD. But if uh, people were living two or three hundred years, or, or really uh, an indefinite lifespan, if uh, we managed to basically just stop aging altogether, then people could spend fifty years training uh, until they were just uh, you know. By, by today's standard, ab- absolute world experts, uh, and then uh, they, they could work in the field uh, for, the, for the rest of their lives, you know, developing even even more expertise. So it could be a, an enormous transformation uh, in terms of uh, productivity. That's right. And and another way to look at the same issue is to say, all right, right now what's happening is we're extending the lifespan, but we're not extending the health span. In other words, we're having increasingly long periods at the end of life where people are frail, they're in nursing homes, they're in memory care, they have Alzheimer's. Um, and not only does this create tremendous amounts of human misery, it sucks up, up immense amounts of capital and money that we need for other things. So uh, it's it's just a tremendous loss. It's a tremendous dead weight on society. Um, it's it, it's the more we, we try, I think we're evolved to not think about this. We're evolved to not think about this problem. And it takes, we have to be, we have to really try hard to say, all right, I'm not going to get emotional about this. I'm going to think hard and clearly about this. In terms of benefit to, to me personally, it's hard to think of anything that would be uh, more valuable. 
But in terms of benefit to, to the entire world, I, I could spend time uh, trying to you know, save my own life or save the life of all of the people I know who are alive now. Or I could work on some of these other problems that admittedly might not make sure that, that I live for, for that much longer, but mean that future generations uh, will survive because humanity won't go extinct because of some disaster or civilization won't be, won't be really uh, thrown off track. Uh, where do you kind of stand on, on that trade-off between you know, life extension seems particularly good for the present generation, whereas some other problems might be better if you're thinking about you know, the, the, the lives of future generations as well? Well, uh, there's a number of ways to come at that. Um, first of all, I'm glad people are thinking about these different questions. It's not I, the goal isn't for all EAs to work on aging, right? The goal is for us each to think these things through and try to find our point of leverage. So, but in terms of why I look at this in particular as a high leverage, we mentioned the large number of human life years lost. Um, there's also the point that although it initially this may seem like a first world problem, it may seem selfish to work on aging because it will help us in, and it will help the wealthy nations. Uh, it turns out that if you look at developing nations and the poorer countries, because of um, advances in health care over there, Increasingly, the problems they're having are aging related as well. And the problem there is that they're being faced with these extraordinarily expensive problems of aging without having gone through the process of becoming wealthy countries first. So even though the burden on wealthy countries is immense in terms of the cost of these um, frail elders, if you think about the cost to the developing countries, it's proportionally much, much harder on them. So if we tend to think of aging as a first world problem. It totally is not. It's a problem that affects even poor countries now, and they are the least able to handle it. So I think it's, it's really a global problem. Do you want to comment on the, on the technical side of anti-aging work? Aging is a, is a tremendously difficult technical problem. However, um, I kind of like the strategy that Aubrey de Grey argues for, which is a repair scenario. Rather than trying to prevent all aging processes, which was really hard, although in the long term perhaps we can do it, uh, in the near term we can probably focus on doing repairs of I think he identifies something like seven major processes, whatever the exact number is. And he's got some pretty creative ideas. Some of them, uh, some of them will work. Some of them are, are, uh, will probably need some modification. But I think that we can come up with some workarounds, some, some shortcuts, some tricks that will gain us time while we work on the really deep fundamental issues. Hmm. So you, you don't think it's uh, it's too impractical to imagine that we could make significant progress on aging within a couple of decades? Is, is it possible that you know this this could actually help help me or you, or is it is it more something that we're doing for for our children? There's disagreement on that. I think I think that um, I think it could certainly to the folks who are listening to this, many of whom are in their twenties. I absolutely think it it could help that generation. So whether it can help my generation, which is one generation older. Um, I think in our case, perhaps it will, um, I think, I think there, it, it could, it could, I think it's quite possible. And then there's always the backup emergency strategy of cryonics. Uh, some of the people I know in EA are signed up for cryonics. I am signed up. So it's that sort of, you know, your worst case scenario is, well, we'll just have to wait, wait it out and uh, hope that advanced technology eventually kicks in and can do the repairs. What do you think uh, are the odds of that? I think the the technical odds are excellent. I think the challenges come in terms of things like societal disruption that would uh, disturb the organizational structure that has been uh, come up with to make sure that the people who um, are in cryonic suspension are well taken care of at the right temperatures and the electricity doesn't fail. Remember, we just talked about electricity failures. So, um, so there are societal issues, but I think the technology, the science will eventually work out. So, as I understand it, we're, we're pretty good at doing the, the preservation and we're, and we're getting better at figuring out well, what do you need to put through someone's body, uh, before you freeze them to make sure that uh, all of the, all of the structures and, uh, aren't, aren't, aren't disturbed at all. 
But do, do you really think it's, it's that likely that um, at some point in the future we'll be able to, you know, reanimate people effectively or undo the damage that, that, that caused them to die? I, I guess, um, I guess I, I feel like I'm fairly optimistic about this, but that, that still seems to me, uh, you know, not, not, not super likely. We're talking about like 5% or 10% rather than 50%. Okay, I want to kind of turn around. You made two points and I kind of want to tweak on both. One is, you know, the question is, is damage caused by the current suspension procedures? I think damage still, even though, uh, even though it has improved, damage still is caused. Um, I think it's repairable damage. But, uh, but there is some damage still. Now, they are coming up with new procedures, um, involving, um, pressure, I believe, which reduces damage even more. So, uh, but I think whatever repair procedures take place in the future, they're going to have to, for people who are suspended today, there is going to have to be some repair work of the damage itself. So then the second part was, what about doing repairs on the original problem that caused the person to die, whether it be cancer or heart disease or Alzheimer's, whatever. Um, on that one, interestingly, I'm more optimistic in the sense that by the time these repairs are being attempted, we will have such incredible amount of data on what a healthy body looks like. And then, so, so we will know. We'll know in great detail, right down to the molecular level, what healthy bodies look like and how they function. And then we have the challenge of saying, all right, how are we going to do the repairs? How are we actually going to repair this person? Um, getting rid of the cancer or cleaning out the heart disease or you know, getting rid of the plaques in the brain for Alzheimer's. But if you have a model of what a healthy body looks like, if you really have excellent data on that, then you know what you want to build, which brings it down to, all right, we have an engineering problem. How do we get those molecules where we want them to be? And if you take a long enough time horizon, you can say, all right, we will someday figure that out. We don't know when, but as long as the person is stable, uh, it's like it's, they've been given first aid, they're stable, they can wait, they can wait a really long time if they have to. Um, we'll just wait until the technology's there, how, however long it takes. How, how much does it cost, roughly? Uh, for a young person, it's quite cheap. Um, the insurance, you, it's usually done through, you pay for it with life insurance, and if you're young, life insurance is super cheap. Um, and it's a few hundred dollars a year in dues. So for young people, it's very cheap. Um, if you wait until you're 80 and you haven't bought the life insurance, then I think it's like, I think one, one version of it is under 100000 Was So uh, it's pricey. So I would say... I mean, just for peace of mind, I'd say, well, why not do it when you're young? Yeah. So it's expensive, but it's not beyond the reach of, uh, of uh, you know, everyone. Yeah. Well, if you think about what we spend on health care for people who are in their last five years of life, it's huge. Yeah. So this is, it's it's not too different from that. Mm. Should I get Chronix? I've, I've thought about it. Um, it's so cheap. Yeah. You know. Why not? Why not? Yeah. So is, is, is there a lot of paperwork to go through? There's some paperwork, but, you know, EAs are smart. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> you can do it. Actually, they had a party at CIFAR. I think it was yeah. at CIFAR. Uh, they had a little Cranix party to help you with the uh, paperwork. Uh, cool. So tell them they need to do that again. And now yeah. that you live in Berkeley, you can just go to the party. Do, do I have to stay near California or no, something? No, 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 no. It's worldwide. Just it's go worldwide. wherever you want. Yeah. But but what if I die when I'm in in, in China? Then um, well, it's a challenge. what what uh, what we do, what I do is they've said, hey, if you're going to go outside the U.S., just let us know so we can be aware. Yeah. Um, it would make it much harder, certainly. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, but anywhere in the U.S., as long as they can, uh, you know, keep you cool? For, well, they will do as best they can, no matter yeah, where you are. Right, They'll yeah, okay. do their best okay. for you. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Yeah. I suppose uh, one, one reservation I have is just a, perhaps a bit more skepticism than you about the, the likelihood of uh, your like, body remaining frozen for long enough for these technologies to, to be created. Perhaps another one is just a... It, it makes me nervous to think what what world might I be I be waking up into. It, it's true I, I didn't get to choose the world that I was born into, so it's a, kind of a similar problem. But I just worry that I might be uh, brought back into a world that uh, that I wouldn't want to live in. And yet, and of course, you can't can't always uh, choose well, that. You always have options for not participating. Yeah, yeah I suppose that's true. Um, do you think it would be good for technology to advance uh, more quickly, or perhaps even more slowly? 
Wow, great question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. I think it, uh, if there was some magical way where we could say defensive technology would go faster and offensive technology would go slower, that's what we would want. So I would say if we, there are ways to speed up defensive technologies, basically throw money at those specifically. Um, and I would, so I would say that's what we would want. But in terms, I don't know how, I don't know what the trade-offs are right now, whether offensive is moving. I think in general, offense is easier than defense. Mm. And that's a scary thing. Why do you think that? I think defense is sort of inherently challenging. Um, it's certainly challenging in software. Um, although there is hope. I mean, remember, we used to all get spam, and now we don't get that much spam. Yeah. You know, we found a way to deal with that. But, but I guess it's hard to do the defense until you know what the offense is, so they kind of get first strike. That's right. That's right. So the proposal has been, well, you can model the offense and then build the defense and just hope that you build it before the offense reaches the stage where it's actually implemented in the physical world. Mm. So that's that's one way to do it, is to say, you know, you imagine all the attacks that could possibly happen, whether it's physical or software, and then try to build defenses against them. Mm. Uh, but it's it's hard. It's very hard. Yeah. I think relative to a lot of other people I know, I'm relatively pessimistic about the value of speeding up technology. I, it, it's not that I'm confident that it's a it's a bad idea to just speed up GDP growth or speed up technological advancement. But I, I don't see the arguments in favor of going faster as being that compelling. And I, and I have a talk where, where I go through some uh, some of the arguments here um, that, I, that I'll put up a link to. But broadly speaking, you were talking about offensive versus defensive technology because technology can, can both make the world worse and also create new potential for abuse. And so there's some technologies that, that make the world safer and more secure and uh, allow people to guard against uh, the risks from, from other technological developments. And there's other things, which, you know, like missile, missile technology or rockets, where it seems like the, the downside risks uh, are larger than, than, than the upside risks. And overall, it seems like technology for the last few hundred years has been making the world um, on a day-to-day -day basis better and better and better. But my, my impression is it's also made it kind of riskier and, and, and riskier. It's true, we, we don't have wars as, as often as we used to, but if we, if we now have a single great power war um, between you know, two nuclear powers, then that's, that's basically the end of civilization as, as we know it for now. We, we might be able to, to rebuild um, at some point in future, but it would be just a catastrophic setback. So think, think that the state is getting better, but it's becoming more and more variable. And, and I'm just not sure that moving forward faster actually uh, makes it happen in a more, more safe and sustainable way, or whether it just means that we're, that we're rushing headlong into, into a disaster. Uh, I'm, I'm just, just uh, agnostic on that question. Well, it's, it's a big question. One reason I don't spend too much time on it is that I don't feel that I have much control on that. Mm. What I do have some control over or possible influence on is this ratio of offense to defense. So I can try to say, all right, the world needs to, and my personal current crusade might be, hey, you know, we need to do, we need to do defensive software, which means computer security. We need to do defensive biology, which means preventing aging. Um, so just focusing more on the defense. But in terms, there's another factor <clears throat> that you didn't mention here, which is in addition to things getting more dangerous in terms of a great power confrontation, one thing that's definitely happening is smaller and smaller groups of people are, are being able to do offensive attacks with powerful technologies. For example, it's coming that eventually smaller groups of people are going to have biological weapons of some, are going to be able to develop uh, artificial, vi you know, new viruses or tweaks on viruses. Um, so, so those are, that's another risk and that's, that's happening too. Mm. So yeah, things are riskier for sure. And that's why we need more and more focus on defensive technologies. Mm. Yeah, we have uh, two episodes about the risks from uh, synthetic uh, biology that I, that I think should be out by the time this this episode uh, goes on the, on the site. So I'll, I'll put up a link to those if people are, are interested uh, to, to learn more. I, I completely agree that uh, because so many people are trying to work on technological progress in general or trying to grow the economy, even if just to you know, start a business and, and support their family, uh, each one of us has relatively little influence over, over those things. So 
that's that's probably another reason to think that just trying to increase GDP growth or increase technological advancement in general probably isn't that high leverage an area because it's 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 not that it's not that neglected. Uh, but I think I do sometimes speak to people who uh, their, their their plan for doing good in the world is just to grow the economy, uh, and and to an extent that when I was in the Australian government working as an economist, that's basically what I was doing was just trying to increase economic productivity. Uh, and I think now I'm just uh, have a lot more question marks about uh, about how valuable that is really. So completely changing track. Um, do you have uh, any other advice that uh, people can use to kind of plan out their lives in order to accomplish as much as they can uh, in in the long term? Like, you know, where might they live? How might they organize their, their personal life? I do. I do. Um, because so many of our listeners, so many EAs are in the early, early stages of their careers, they still have a lot of choices to make in terms of what their life path is going to be. So I just have a couple of points on that. Um, one is we've all heard the phrase, you know, put on your own oxygen mask before helping others. And what that is about is that if your goal is to maximize the good you do in the world, you're thinking about a career of decades, right? At least. We're, who knows? If anti-aging works out, it could be longer. But let's say at least decades, right? Um, but one thing that happens routinely with altruists, whether they're in the EA movement or outside it, is they throw themselves at these problems, not taking care of themselves, not taking care of other parts of their lives, and then they burn out or flame out in some serious way. And then, they ha then they're very unhappy, perhaps they leave the altruistic movement. So, so the goal is to come up with, a, with enough balance in your life so that you have the capacity and the stamina and are getting enough positive feedback in your life and have, have the material necessities of your life are sufficiently in place that you can have the lifestyle you need to continue for decades. Now, for some people, that's fine. They can live in a closet and, you know, eat, eat cardboard. And, and they, some people have very low material needs. That's cool. And if they think that they can sustain that for decades, that's great. Most of us aren't like that. You know, most of us want to have a, a, a comfortable place to live. We want to have good food to eat. We want to have good friends. We want to have an occasional vacation. Some of us want to have families, right? Not everyone, but many people do. And so when you're planning your effective altruism careers, whether it's, whether it's earning to give or working at a particular project or starting your own nonprofit as I did, um, you have to think about these things and say, all right, how am I going to get the income I need to have a a decent lifestyle that will keep me going for decades. Or if I've decided to have a family, how am I going to pay for that family? Um, you know, do I want to find a life partner? I personally think it's a very valuable thing to have in your life, especially for altruists, because um, it's very handy to have someone who, for example, either is, if, if the person... Perhaps the person is, is not an EA quite to the extent that you are, then that person maybe has a steady job, which is very handy to have if, if uh, you're trying to pay rent or a mortgage. Um, or if the, maybe the person is a fellow EA, which is, can be a great deal of fun, the two of you can take turns making sure there's enough money to keep the household going. So um, there's just a lot of benefits to picking the right life partner if you're an EA. Yeah, I saw uh, you have on YouTube uh, a couple of talks you've given. Uh, that one was called uh, "Finding Love and, and a Life Partner." Do, do you have any, any other advice on on that uh, on that issue? Uh, what, what approach did you take? I do. Um, I think that if you want a life, I, I kind of lay it out in the talk, and I actually have a book draft, which I'm happy to send anybody who sends me an email, and I'm easy to find on the internet. Um, so. Basically, it, I lay out a strategy for finding a life partner that matches your what you want in, in terms of character. Now, obviously, as effective altruists, we need to find life partners who either are fellow effective altruists or at least are enthusiastic about our efforts in that area. They don't have to be full-time. They don't have to even become part of the movement, but they have to support our work. What about other topics like uh, where do you, where do you think people should live? I guess you you were brought up in the Bay Area near SF, or or you moved here. 
No, I moved here. I was brought up in New York State, then went to MIT, and then uh, did a little bit of earning to give, and then um, a bunch of us realized, and we were we were very young, idealistic folks, very much like EA folks who were in our 20s. We said we were scattered all over the country, um, but we wanted to work together on altruistic projects. And we said, where are we all mo- willing to move to? And the only place that everyone was willing to move to was the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. So that's what we did. We all moved here, and we did our work together, and it was great. Um, now, we don't need all effective altruists to move to the Bay Area. You know, we don't really want that. It's a very expensive area to live in, um, and we want altruism to happen all over the world. So. Uh, each one of us has to think about, all right, what specific things am I working on? Where am I going to find, you know, can I do it alone? Do I need a team? Where can I pull that team together? Um, it may not. There's a lot of, a lot of great folks here, and it's a great place of, of ferment in terms of EA, but there are other good places as well. So uh, although you, what you might consider doing, a lot of people do, is come here for some period of time. Some people stay, some people take what they've learned and go, go elsewhere. They may go home to where they came from, or they may start in a totally different place. Hmm. Yeah, on this, on this topic of lifestyle strategy, I, I, when, I, when I was uh, younger, maybe uh, five or ten years ago, I used to think that there was a, a lot of tension between uh, you know, having a good life personally and, and doing a lot of good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've learned that, that uh, sometimes there are conflicts mm-hmm. there. Sometimes there's trade-offs, to be sure. But by and large, uh, it's very hard to be highly productive and uh, you know get a lot of work done for many years unless your life is is in reasonably good order. Unless you have good personal relationships, you're taking care of your mental health, you're getting getting treated for anything that you need to get treated for, you know, taking care of your physical health as well, and, and just feeling comfortable in your life. If if you don't have enough money to support yourself, and, and that that makes you anxious, or you don't have enough money to get healthcare, or you don't have friends to support you, it's just so hard to get a project off the ground and and stick with it. Uh, uh, you know, year after year after year, and, and it's just highly likely that you're going to at, at some point uh, give up. That's very true. So um, it's a balancing act, and I think if the goal and and our goal should be, I think, to maximize the the work that we do for good over a lifespan. You, that doesn't mean maximizing the amount of work you do right now. It may mean pacing yourself, uh, taking care of your financial needs, taking care of your family issues, especially taking care of your health, right? That's super critical. You don't want to, you don't want to burn the candle at both ends for too long. When you're really young, like in your early twenties, you can work long, long hours and you're fine. Um, but don't assume you can be able to do that forever. <laughs> you, eventually you're going to pace yourself. You're going to say, Hey, you know, I need that vacation. And I do recommend vacations for EAs because what happens to me, and this happens every single time, you know, it seems like a luxury, but I go away for, you know, two or ideally three weeks is better, actually. It works better. And then you come back and you're so supercharged for, and you have new ideas, new enthusiasm. You're just raring to go. And all that excitement that you were kind of dragging before, suddenly your work looks fun again. So I would say, even though it's hard to get away, try to get away for two or ideally three weeks a year at least. And, and by vacation, remember the, the vacation is about vacating, right? Go somebody, go someplace else, get out of your apartment, get out of your house, go somewhere far away. You can probably stay with EA somewhere, right? They probably would be thrilled to have you crash on their couch and tell you about what, tell them about what you're doing and hear what they're doing. So get, get out now and then. Yeah. As I, uh, as I, as I get older, I'm starting to notice uh, some of the first signs of, uh, signs of aging, my, you know, aches and pains where I didn't have them before. Mm-hmm. Not, don't quite have quite the same energy to go out several nights in a row. Perhaps get hung over where I didn't used to. Mm-hmm. I guess that the, the, the anti-aging work can't come soon enough as, as far as I'm personally concerned. You got that right. <laughs> so uh, are there any other lessons that we can learn from your career and uh, any other examples that you've said that people could follow? Uh, well, yeah, I would say one thing, um, one thing I found very useful for what I like to do is if you have a passion for a new topic, it's perfectly okay to start a whole new organization around it, and that's what we did. Um, we probably could have found an existing organization that would allow us to work with them, but that doesn't give you the freedom that you have if you start your own thing. It's very easy to start a nonprofit. 
Um, the paperwork isn't that hard. The challenge is raising the money. So, if, but if you think you, if you have a passionate cause uh, that's relatively new, um, if you can find people who are excited about it and will donate, it's perfectly fine to start your own group. Um, and we did that. We were still in our 20s, started our own nonprofit, and it worked out very well. Because if you keep it small, um, you're terribly nimble. You can, you, you don't, there's not a lot of politics. Um, those of you who've worked in organizations, whether they're for profit or nonprofit, you know that politics is the mind killer that makes everything not fun. And when things aren't fun, it's very hard to get good work done. So the way to keep it non-political, and at least the way we've done it, is you have very high standards of behavior for everyone involved, and um, you keep things small and keep it so you can move fast, make decisions quickly. And that has worked well for us. And I don't think it's necessary to go work in a big nonprofit first. For example, um, when when he took over at MIRI, Machine Intelligence Research Institute, Luke Melhauser, uh was I don't think he had nonprofit experience. So what he did was he went around to everybody he knew who had nonprofit experience and interviewed them at great length and took copious notes. And I was one of the people on his list. I'm sure he talked to many others. And basically, rather than um, spending many years learning these lessons by uh, working in another organization, he just went around and got the same exact information through interviews much quicker. Um, so I, I would say, and, and then he did a great job at Miri. And I think it's because he did those interviews, took it very seriously. Uh, and if you can find advisors who will tell you the truth, for example, um, things like what I just said about the politics, you know, when you're picking your board, make sure that there's no politics. Just don't, do not tolerate politics. We don't do that stuff in our organization. Um, I think I think that was really smart of Luke, and it worked well. So, and Miri, I think, uh, did well under his direction because of that. So, yeah, I, I'm an enthusiast of if you can't find an organization that's doing what you want to do, just start your own. Uh, you just make sure you have that support, and uh, and then you can do it. You can do it in your twenties. I did. So you said that uh, early in your career, you were driven a lot by concerns about, uh, you know, overpopulation and, and resource scarcity. Uh, it seems like people in the effective altruism community are maybe less worried about those risks than than people in the in the general population. Uh, we tend to be more concerned about other threats from from new technologies, not not so much climate change, but perhaps like new new weapons that our countries might use against one another, or ways that technologies could accidentally turn out to be really catastrophic. Uh, are you still concerned about uh, you know environmental problems, or have you also kind of moved on to these to these other perverse effects of technology? That's a good point, um, and I think it's appropriate, really, that EAs are focusing elsewhere, and here's why. Back when I was first thinking about these things, there wasn't really much societal support for environmental improvement. Uh, there was no department, uh, there, was, there was no envir environmental protect protection agency, these kinds of things, or, were the, or it was very small. So, so back then, these things were under underrepresented in terms of people working on them. Um, but now we have this huge bureaucracy and lots and lots and lots of people and lots of regulations and lots of, there's academic work. I mean, there's huge amounts of work in the mainstream world on environmental problems. So since EAs are looking for leverage points and places that need more attention, it's perfectly reasonable for them to say, hey, other folks are already addressing this. Uh, you know, there's huge conferences where where all the countries come together to talk about these issues. Um, we don't, you know, it's not a leverage point for us. We should look for problems that are either newer or are, if not new, they're at least not sufficiently appreciated. We should look for places where our efforts as individuals or as an EA movement, which is still relatively small, uh, can make a, a huge difference. And that is not by taking on a big global problem where, where there's huge numbers of government employees already looking at it. So it makes sense to me that that's, that they are changing their focus. And 
Um, so for me also, I'm not looking at traditional solutions to environmental problems. I'm looking for unusual ones where something unusual can be done, something that's not well understood, not well represented yet. And I think that makes a lot of sense given the size of our movement. Mm. Yeah, I think that's something that it's very easy for, for people to misunderstand when they read 80,000 hours uh, materials. Uh, we have a, have a problem on, a uh, problem profile on climate change. Uh, and we don't take, and I certainly don't take a contrarian view at all on, on how bad climate change, uh, will be or how big a threat it is. I, I think it's just as serious as, you know, I just take the, the main, the scientific consensus. Uh, basically, uh, as, a, as a given, the, the the reason that perhaps we don't prioritize it so much is that we've looked at how much money is already being spent on the problem, and you, you can find about three hundred billion dollars worth of spending globally that is, uh, in some form, meant meant to tackle climate change, which is you know 05 percent of global global GDP, uh, and, and it's just vastly more than is spent, say, on work to promote peace, and uh, you know even in just all work to promote international cooperation, that kind of thing. It's 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 really uh, is quite a large budget, um, and there's there's other problems that seem you know in the ballpark of being being as serious as climate change, but attract you know, a hundredth as as much as much spending, and and that's that's why we tend to focus on those. It makes perfect sense to me. I think that for for our movement, um, given its size and where we are in our in in for most of us are still pretty young, I think looking for these new challenges, new leverage points. Under underappreciated problems, that's where that's where we're going to make a difference. So let's try to get even more concrete with uh, you know things that that people could uh, do if they're listening to this and they, and they want to tackle similar problems to to what you've uh, spent your life working on. Well, can people work at the Foresight Institute? Are you hiring? Huh? We're not hiring. <laughs> okay. We're tiny. I would say. Um, you know, one thing I think that probably EAs could do, and this is something many EAs are, would be able to do, whether it's for Foresight or any organization, um, and certainly something that everyone who earns to give should consider, uh, one area that virtually all EA efforts need is fundraising. Now, fundraising, it sounds kind of hard, it sounds difficult. It sounds unpleasant to do. It turns out, though, once you actually get into it, that it can, it can be fun in the sense that what you're doing is you're growing the team. Basically, you're reaching out to other people who share your values. These are folks who may be farther along in their careers. Many of them have mortgages. They have families, things like this. So, so they don't have the option to be a full-time altruist. They're kind of stuck in the earning to give model at this point of their lives. Uh, but they want to help. They want to be part of the team. They want to participate. And, and, and you can help them do that because your passion, your excitement for your cause, whether, uh, whether it's existential risk or animal, uh, you know, reducing animal suffering, whatever your passion is, um, if you can locate folks who want to be on the team, but, but have various constraints on their time, you enable them to join the team and be part of this exciting effort. And when, when you make those connections, it's tremendous fun. It's actually a blast. And a lot of these folks who join the team through this earn to give model, um, they're actually fun folks to know. And that's one of the best things about being an altruist is that the people you meet on this pathway through life, they're the best people on the planet. They are the people who care about other people, who care about animals, who care about the biosphere. These are the people who want to make a positive difference in the world, and they often are super intelligent, super nice people. And some of them have done very well in life in terms of uh, their financial achievements, and that enables them to help your organization. It also enables them to uh, basically help you have fun in your life, and that's important. Having fun doing your altruism is important. Because that's what keeps you going for 30, 40, 50 years doing it. You have to have, it has to be fun. It doesn't have to be fun every second, but it should be fun. Now, another thing that makes this easier than it ever was before is there's two reasons why there's more money in the hands of young people today than there probably has been in the past ever, which is number one, high tech jobs. 
People who come straight out of school and jump into a high-tech job are paid very well. So these are folks, they may be almost as altruistic as you, but they are earning to give. So making connections with those folks is a great way to make a difference for your organization. And then also, there's an awful lot of cyber currency money out there right now being held by very young people. These are folks who kind of lucked out, right? They were in the right place at the right time. They made some good decisions. Now they're sitting on a really large sum of money. Um, and these are these these people are super idealistic and altruistic often. So if you can connect up to them, you can pull that money toward important causes. So. And that's, that's something almost anyone can do if you, if you care enough, if you're willing to develop the communication skills, and if you're willing to learn how to, how to reach out to folks and make those personal connections. So it's a great pathway, and it's not as hard and not as unpleasant as people tend to think. It can be actually fun. Let's say you were speaking to an undergraduate who was, you know, pretty bright, uh, and they're, they're open to doing kind of any, any major. Uh, what things would you want to see more people in the effective altruism community uh, studying? There's um, for folks who are technical, who have a mathematical bent. I would say um, we really, even though there's a lot of them already, we need we need more great computer scientists. So computer science is is worth learning. Um, it has a lot of benefits. We've already talked about the need for computer security um, as a vital as a vital thing that needs to be done, whether it's by EA or elsewhere. Uh, it's also a great way to do earning to give. So it's in case, in case you decide, hey, you know, I want to spend a few years of my life raising a family. Many people do want to do that. Um, computer science gives you that income that enables you to both raise a family and earn to give at the same time. And then you can always uh, do full-time EA work both before and after that family is raised. So it gives you tremendous flexibility. Computer science is a great option there. Mm -hmm. um, the sciences in general, I studied chemistry. It's a great background for anything in the physical sciences. If you decide that that, that kind of thing is what you'd like to do, um, I think it's possible to be an EA probably with just about any background. So it's critical to figure out, number one, where your skill sets lie, if you, if you can, if you can, if do you have any gifts. Um, and then, um, what, you know, what excites you? What, what can you picture spending decades doing, uh, possibly for not a huge amount of money? Where, what, what makes you, what makes you think, wow, I, I enjoy doing that. I could do that for that long. You know, not too many people want to do stock trading for decades. It's pretty unpleasant work. Mm. Given your interests in things like life extension and uh, atomically precise manufacturing and, and AI and so on, do you think that we should be encouraging more people to specialize in particular areas of science and technology where they, where they can really become experts in those those particular topics and, and make a real contribution and understand them well enough that they can uh, figure out how they can be made safe for the world? I would say, yeah. In addition to the computer security, I think we do need more people in uh, aging research, and that's a very specific field. And I would say, you know, for those of you who kind of enjoy biology or chemistry, that's a great pathway. Um, and there, there is money available, so you can have a, you can, you can do good work and get paid. For example, um, my husband is, um, he is a hydrologist. He works for the USGS, and he gets paid a, a decent, not, not a, a, not a huge amount of money, but a, you can, you can live a very nice life on the salary. And he also knows he is doing wonderful things in his job. So he is, uh, he's got the best of both worlds. He's getting paid to do something he loves to do that actually helps the environment also. And there are jobs like that out there and it's worth putting some effort into trying to find them. Hmm. So the, the Foresight Institute isn't hiring. Uh, are there any other organizations that people might not be aware of that uh, you think they should think about applying to now or, or preparing themselves to be able to work at in future? Well, uh, whatever, whatever you are most inspired by, for example, I just heard that the Future of Life Institute is looking for an AI policy person. Now there's something really fun to work on. So for someone who feels that they are qualified for that, that would be something to, to look into. 
Um, but, but most of these groups are pretty small, frankly. So, um, targeting an individual group, uh, is challenging, although it can be done. For example, Alison Dutman, who is co-leading the workshop here at EAG with me, uh, she works at Foresight now, and she made a decision when she was in school. She was at the London School of Economics. She surveyed all the nonprofits and decided Foresight was the right one for her. And it took a lot of persuading on her part for her to convince us that, that, that this is right. It turns out she was correct. She has been a fantastic addition to our staff. So for those of you who are super persistent and you know for sure uh, that, that one particular organization is where you want to be, um, the way she did it was she initially started by volunteering, which is often, you know, you have to get to know the leadership, um, and volunteering is the fastest way to get them to say yes. Uh, once they see what a great performer you are, yeah, maybe they'll bring you on staff. That's how it happened with Allison. Mm. One thing that a lot of people can find uh, tricky early on in their career is finding mentors who can you know, show them the ropes and give them all of this inside knowledge that might not be written up anywhere. Do, do you have any advice on, on how people can find mentors who can support them through their career? Yeah, I think the, the thing to realize is it's kind of a two-way street, which is you're asking someone with more experience to help you and there has to, ideally, if you can think of a way, there ideally is some way for you to help them back. Um, now, maybe they're 100% altruistic, but even so, there should be some way for you to help them. Um, for example, perhaps they're writing a book, or maybe they should write a book and they don't have time. Well, you could say, hey, I would love to help you write your book. You know, let's, let's do some recordings. Let's do some audio recordings. I will, you know, I'll get them transcribed. I'll put it into an outline and try to do a draft based on what you said. And in fact, that is a strategy that, um, Allison used, uh, with, uh, one of our senior fellows, Mark Miller. He, he knows a great deal about computer security and, uh, and how it might affect AI. This is something Allison would like to learn. So she said, hey, let's, you know, I will help you write a paper on this. Uh, and that's how we did it. Uh, Mark didn't have time to write, but he did have time to just give us a few hours of talking. So we interviewed him. We, we recorded it all, transcribed it, and then massaged it into a paper, which we will link to in the references on this show. So, you know, yes, it was a lot of work for Allison, but it's a great way to, number one, learn the content, and number two, build a great relationship with with your mentor, because now your mentor is super impressed and is going to go way out of his or her way to help you in your career. What uh, conferences do you go to if someone was trying to uh, get, get, get you as a mentor? How could, they, how could they possibly meet you? Oh, I'm easy. I'm easy to meet. I invite people over for tea at my house all the time. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so which, which conferences do, do you go to? And uh, if people are interested in this kind of same things as, as you, there's, there's EA Global where we're at, of course. Uh, are there any others that you regularly attend? Oh, I go to a lot of conferences. I just, uh, in conflict with this meeting, actually, is the Startup Society Summit, which looks at blockchain, seasteading, um, special economic zones. Um, I go to aging conferences, I go to um, I go to futurism conferences in general. I, I I go to a wide variety, and I find I, all of them are valuable. So it's pretty easy. Actually, the easiest way to, to meet me at a conference is get me invited as a speaker, because then I show up and I give my talk and talk to whoever wants to talk to me. So that works great. What's been the biggest downside of, of the path that you've taken? Let's see. Um, I, ha I can't say there are big downsides, actually, because um, I realized pretty early on that it was necessary to have that balance. Um, like most people in their 20s, I was heading off into, well, I'll just sacrifice my whole life for this. I won't pay attention to income. I won't pay attention to my health. I'll just burn the candle at both ends, work every hour that I possibly can, but I realized, okay, this is not work. This is not sustainable. It's fine for a little while, but then it's not sustainable. So I thought, all right, we have to come up with a model where I get a decent income. I can afford health insurance. I can pay my rent. I can go on an occasional vacation. And all that has worked out. So I don't actually have any regrets at this point. I think it worked well. And the main thing I'd recommend to young folks on this pathway is, 
the sooner you realize about the balance thing, the better. And uh, put some work into selecting your life partner. Make sure that all the character traits you need are there and that the person appreciates your EA efforts, uh, either joins you in them or at least is appreciative of the fact that you do them. Uh, and make sure that you, you, you have a pattern that will last for decades. My guest today has been Christine Peterson. Thanks so much for coming on the 80,000 Hours Podcast. Great, Rob. This has been so fun. I hope you enjoyed that episode. It was good to get a chance to talk to someone who's been working to improve the world a lot longer than I have. If you did enjoy it, then uh, consider sharing it with your friends on Facebook or Twitter so they can find out about the show. And if you'd like to work on reducing the risks from new technologies and foreseeing the the problems that they might bring, then you should definitely apply for coaching from 80,000 hours. We've helped a lot of people find uh, relevant job opportunities and figure out how they can scale up to get the roles that they want in future. There's a link to apply for coaching in the podcast show notes and the blog post. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.